hit the road here. All right, so uh, welcome everybody to February. Uh, I'm joining you remotely from Jamaica uh, at the moment. So pardon my lack of video lag and otherwise um, ghostly appearance. Um, I am going to run us through slides really quick and then hand off, but um, I wanna say thank you and, and a big shout out to our sponsors. We've got CloudBees on board for quite some time now. We've got our old friends, JFrog, who you should check out if you are uh, scaling DevOps, if you're serious about um, you know, building out some major capabilities, check out these vendors. They're, they're big in the space. They know what they're doing and uh, they, they release tools and services that can really help you out. And we really appreciate them uh, supporting the community. With that, I'm going to introduce Sean and and hand off, um, I just noticed you've got two sleeves. That's cool. So you got one fire yeah. sleeve and the other is seemingly a uh, random, non-random collection of, of tattoos. I like it. Yep. Yep. It's nice um, sleeve. So uh, Sean's going to be talking about optimizing workloads, um, which is, I think, especially relevant in 2023 when everyone is tightening the, you know, tightening belts and making sure that everything is uh, running at, at uh, peak efficiency because everything is very expensive at the moment and you know everyone's dealing with layoffs and scale backs and all kinds of challenges um, so with that I'm going to stop sharing hand off to him and let him uh, take uh, take it away all right thanks Steve let me see if I can share my screen out here and I want to bring up PowerPoint and I want to go is that sharing correctly let's see i can't see myself so i'm hoping that screen sharing is paused hold on one second i'm having a minute here there we go oh yep all right everybody there we go you should be able to see my screen now, and I'm going to turn off the captions. Um, can everybody see my screen? All right. Just see me. You don't see my screen? Not yet. There we go. How's that? Let's try that. There we go. Now I'm screen sharing. Nailed it. All right. Optimizing workloads in your environment and strategies for maximizing savings and improving efficiencies in the cloud for 2023 and beyond. So um, as Steve mentioned, my name is Sean Harris. I am the developer relations lead for Spot by NetApp. Uh, we are a group inside of NetApp. I've been in the IT industry for about 20 years. I started out in 1999, I think. Um, previously, I've worked as a DevOps lead and principal cloud architect for, software, for some ISVs and different companies that were trying to move into the cloud. Um, Mr. Fix It, when something goes wrong, um, I'm usually the person people call first. And if they can't fix it, I try. And I love infrastructure as code. It's kind of my passion to automate all the things. So let's first talk about a cloud journey. Um, and first, and I'm going to throw up the chat here so that I can see who's asking questions and whatnot. So if you have questions, please drop them into the chat. I will stop. This presentation is not very long. I want to leave a lot of time for questions and answers or just um, to talk about different topics as we go into what optimization is. So the evolution of a cloud journey, day zero is, I call it the crawl phase. It's where you're making your initial design decisions, your platform choice, how you're going to integrate, you know, where you're going to land. Day one is your configuration and deploy, getting into the cloud. And now we're at day two, running. So you're talking about scaling. We're talking about performance. We're talking about availability. And then cost, visibility, and management. And a little understood, or a little, people forget, a little understood curiosity of cloud consulting and optimization. Saving money is really secondary. So when people say optimization, sometimes they mean saving money, but a lot of it is just understanding what your workload is. It's about validating that you're spending the right thing, the right amount of money in the right places 
And the engineering has done everything they could and should in providing the proof in the pudding to your management that what you're running is the right size, the right speed, and everything is copacetic from a stunt standpoint. And spending is becoming even more of a topic as we start seeing companies starting to do reorgs, layoffs, trying to claw back some of that cloud spend. Explaining what's fundamentally an engineering problem to the rest of the business is very hard. And you'll see it a lot. And, and, and DevOps for us face it from multiple facets because we're not product, we're not developers full-time. We're running the cloud operations. So not my problem. You know, if something's not running right, it's got to be the DevOps team. That's your problem. I don't know what a KA is. I don't know what a container is. That's I'm just running my code. Cost, like we talked about, that's the secondary thing. But who spent all this money? Where is our money going when we give money to Amazon, when we give money to Google, when we give money to Microsoft for stuff that we can't really see? And then outnumbered. There are, a lot, there are very few DevOps engineers serving many devs, serving many different aspects of the organization. And infrastructure management becomes complex and time consuming and is really our, big, our biggest headache. So we need to start thinking past the traditional CI, CD pipeline as DevOps pros. We need this. We, we know what continuous integration is. We know it's the, the figure eight that we've all come and learn to love. But it's time to start thinking about it from a different, from another aspect or another node off of that. And it's the continuous optimization. It's the continuous operations, this ability to scale, the ability to optimize and analyze and do that in part of your cycle of the CICD pipelines. So we have to solve for why. Infrastructure and platform as a services are growing exponentially. Right. Every year we see the scalers get bigger and bigger and bigger, which means more people are moving workloads. And so the scalers are scaling to meet the usage needs and demands with services and new regions coming online constantly. 70% of cloud spend can be considered waste. And this doesn't mean that seven out of every 10 servers is wasted. It just means it's underutilized. We have a tendency as practitioners to go and do especially early in the cloud journey, to do the one-to-one. -one. We need one server for everything, just like we need in our data center. And that is where the mindset needs to change. And that 70% number isn't just infrastructure. It can be services that you've spun up and forgot about. I mean, how many people have stood up AWS backup and forgot about it because somebody forgot to tear down the vault and you're sitting there paying for money for the storage? These are all things that, you have to have that visibility into or optimization will never occur. Billing accuracy, you need to pay for only for what you use, eliminating that waste that we talk about. And automation is the key to application availability, but it's also the key to optimization. So how do we get there? We have to get past the idea of management of underlying infrastructure. The, the, the term that I've used during my um, time in the cloud is cattle's not pet, cattle not pets right we have to treat servers as expend we have to treat this virtual infrastructure as expendable right no longer is our critical our critical services reliant on the on the server and virtual machine infrastructure that infrastructure is dependent on our on our code on us we need to be able to scale by request based on real-time requirements we need to be able to get that real-time application into what um, our application is doing and how it's scaling out and what resources we can forecast that we need. Again, we talk about utility billing, paying only for what you use, eliminating waste. I'm going to hit that home because of the waste factor. And you need to be able to scale to true zero. Very few, it, natively, it's hard to scale to zero. You always have to keep something running. And there are tools out there that allow you to scale to true zero. And we have to be fast when we scale. We don't have. We don't want to wait for thresh, thresholds or alerts and then trigger an event. We want to be able to satisfy infrastructure needs in a proactive manner. Optimized always on highly utilized compute in the cloud. What does that look like? So we look at Matt. I see your question, and we're going to get examples of tools for getting to zero. Um, we're going to talk about that here 
right after this slide, right before I get into some stuff. So your traditional infrastructure is, let's look at each one of these blocks as a server or some kind of container infrastructure, right? And you go and you stack them all up and you give the developers what you need. It's, hum it's usually human driven, usually over provisioned because your developer said, hey, I need 12 cores and 24 gigs of RAM and you give them 12 cores and 24 gigs of RAM. High use of on-demand and pay-as-you-go infrastructure so you're not getting the um, pricing benefits and breaks that you can um, really maximize your spend with. And it's a uniform homogenous infrastructure. If you stand up a C5 X large, you're gonna keep using the C5 family. You're gonna keep using those instances that you're comfortable with. And this is what the demand curve looks like. It, you really need what's on the curve, but you can see here on the left that we're, we've oversubscribed, we've over provisioned. We've used a bunch of pay, uh, pay as you go instances. We've given the developers exactly what they want, but there's a lot of waste in this curve. And so how do we optimize? We use app-driven provisioning. We use, we try to use commitments and uh, financial packaging from the scalers and excess capacity pricing. And when we say excess capacity, we mean the spot marketplace. Um, every every cloud provider has some sort of excess capacity pricing, and a diversified and um, heterogeneous infrastructure. So you can see here now we've taken that demand curve and we've packed everything into that curve with a variation of the block size and different services, right? So here's our commitment. Now we're using a lot of spot and here are the Pago instances. So we can get that blend and we can get that unified um, cloud environment that is highly optimized using, the, using a mix of instances and a mix of financial commitments that you didn't have before because now we, you can throw some automation behind it. So here we go. We're going to talk to Matt's point about examples of tools for getting zero cops and um, Carpenter from AWS. Um, There's Spot by NetApp. I, I, this is not a sales presentation. This is just an information presentation. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up Spot just a little bit because this is exactly what Spot does. So infrastructure pr pr provisioning and pricing. We we there are tools that help you make that blend where you can use the spot instances and you can run your production environment on spot instances because there are ways to predict what the spot marketplaces and the excess capacity marketplaces are going to do only using on demand when you have to and then use and then reverting to reserved instances savings plans other financial tools that the they have and then the second key to this is pod driven auto scaling and bid packing and so that means you're only using resources that make sense in your environment. So it, maybe you don't need a GPU, but it's the cheapest instance that's out there because somebody has put it up because they need to use it. Throw in a GPU and start using the functions of a GPU for some of your compute stuff and then bid packing mean and continuously right sizing your pods and being able to monitor and being able to say, hey, if I stack something a little bit differently, I can get a lower price and I can right size that environment. So what does that look like? We have one pod that requires 6.5 gigs of memory and one and a half virtual CPUs. So if I use the M5 large, which has exactly 6.5 or which has eight gigs of memory, but needs 6.5, I'm using 81% of my memory, but I'm only using 75% of the CPU and I'm paying nine cents an hour. If I bump that up to an M5X large, which has a little bit more memory and a little bit more CPU capacity, I'm still using that, but I'm still paying the same price. But if I go to an M5X2X large with a lot more memory and a few more cores, I'm using 98% of the memory and I can, get, I can get five extra pods into that one instance. And so I can go up a few sizes and I can, instead of needing five M5 larges or or four M5X larges, I can put it all into one machine and get 93% utilization and still and pay seven cents instead of nine cents, right? So that is the difference. That, and that's, that's where optimization comes in and what we say, what we mean when we say optimization. So we'll look at it one more time. And that same pod, 6.5 gigs of memory and 1.8 CPUs, but we're going to use a different instance family. D5X large has that 
eight gigs of memory in the four cores using 81% of my memory, but only 45% of my CPU. But if I switch that to an M5X large, which is a memory driven instance, because memory is always more expensive than compute power, or sorry, compute power is always more expensive than memory. <clears throat> I now can have that same, that same pod, but two of them on one instance using 16 gigs of memory where I'm using 81% of my memory. And I need 3.6 vCPUs and I have four in the box. Now I'm using 90% of my CPU and I'm paying a little bit and I'm paying that nine and a half cents ish for the, um, for the actual size or for the actual instance. So I've saved 43% at that point. So really that, that's the end of my slides. I, I really want to open it up to questions and make this a interactive, you know, Hit me with your optimization questions. Um, tools for getting to zero. Let me see if I can find, I've got a slide here that I can share out that will, I think, no, I don't have it on this computer. But um, tools for getting to zero. Uh, spot by NetApp can obviously do that. Um, there are some others that work in the same space that don't focus, that focus on one aspect of uh, the optimization and commitment management. And then there are other ways to do it using, like I mentioned, Carpenter, um, which is an AWS specific tool, COPS, which is a Kubernetes specific tool. Um, and then writing your own scripts to get to scale to zero and try and keep something running what we, what we in the ops space call warm versus the um, traditional leave one instance running all the time at full speed and then scale off of that. So I'll open it up to questions, see if anybody has any questions. And if not, we can just continue talking optimization in 2023. Um, I have a quick question. Um, yeah. Sorry. sorry, one, sorry. Um, sorry about that. So my question is um, for continuous optimization, I, I know you mentioned about um, the use of instances and being able to, um, uh, use use spot instances to be able to minimize cost, but is that the only um, strategy, or is there a, or are there other strategies where we can be able to implement that in our infrastructure to also help with um, continuous optimization? So, spot instances and excess capacity are only one part of managing continuous optimization. Continuous optimization really comes down to managing the cost, managing your compute resources, and managing those wasted services like we talked about. Like having some way to alert you on unattached EBS volumes in a regenerate zone that you forgot about, right? You need to have something that can look at your account constantly and look at your running resources constantly um, that can do that full time and send you an email or do or automatically take care of them for you. A lot of the tools, so Cloud Checker, which is a part of Spot by NetApp, but Cloud Health, um, there are a lot of tools out there that will do the alert and do the automation feedback um, to you and do it and, and take care of it and send you a report of what it's taken care of. And so having those tools at the ready, optimized for your accounts, everybody having the right access is a, is a great way to take care of that. But using excess capacity, is another way to optimize because you're not having those servers run full time. You're not having all that spend on servers being underutilized and having some way to maximize what your code is running on and what your programs, what your platform's running on. Being able to watch real time and make those changes is, is crucial to doing that. Steve asked a question, what do I see as the biggest optimization opportunities in 2023? What are people missing? And I'm gonna tell you it's blob storage. People forget about blob storage. He's, people use S3 buckets and um, other uh, non-block-based storage as stashing grounds and people forget about them and don't ever take care of them. And that's a quick way to drive up your spend. Even though it's pennies per gigabyte, the amount of money that you put into it um, long-term and the, and the management of that data and the security implication, right? Can do. The other part of optimization is security because leaving an S3 bucket unchecked with customer data in it can be really expensive and really unoptimized. And it 
yes, they're two different issues, but at the same time, they're the same issue because your jo our job as practitioners is to really come in and give and maximize the investment that our firms, our companies, our project owners are making in the technology investment. And so it's our duty to make sure that we're spending that investment in the best way possible. Do I have any tool, if, do you, if any, have tools to analyze for optimization? Is that a question to the group or is that a question to me specifically? Not referring to FinOps. Okay, so that is a question for me. I use Carpenter a lot um, outside of the Spot portfolio. So Spot is several products. We have the FinOps tool called Eco. But we also have a continuous optimization, two continuous optimization tools. One's called Elastigroup. Group. Um, Elastigroup Group is for your traditional VM-based infrastructure. The other one is called Ocean, and Ocean is all about um, containerization and making sure, and monitoring your Kubernetes environments and your your EKS, AKS, ECS environments for continuous optimization. And that's what does the bin packing and kind of what I, that graph that I showed earlier. Bin packing means stacking your pods on the different um, instance sizes that best fit the utilization. And we accomplish that, and pretty much everybody accomplishes that by doing consistent monitoring using the metrics from your application every 5, 30, depends on the vendor, every up to every couple of minutes to see what your application is doing and proactively prepare to make a move and do it without interrupting your application because the availability is the other crucial part of optimization and being able to make sure that your application is consistently available when you need it and being able to ensure that you're going to perform at scale right and you see and we've seen what happens when people don't perform at scale. Um, it crashes websites it, it it leads to poor feedback it leads to reduced um to it, it impacts your customers, right? And so you need that you need that availability to make, ensure that your that your application and your workloads are doing what they're supposed to when they're supposed to on top of running at the best possible value. Is there a particular cloud easier to optimize than others? Yes, there is. Um, sort of. We are. AWS is the easiest. AWS people, AWS because they're the market leader because they have seventy percent of at some, they have seventy percent of the cloud computing infrastructure market in some form or fashion. Make it really easy to optimize. Azure is getting better, and GCP is making huge strides as well. And but AWS is far and beyond put a lot of time because they have found that when you can save money and you can optimize your infrastructure and you're reducing the cost of your physical VM overhead, it's easier to invest in other services. So they really push the automation uh, or the, optim the constant optimization narrative, especially going into 2023, right? Because the, rea the economic reality of 2023 and beyond is we're preparing for a recession. Is that recession going to hit? We don't know, we're not economists. But at the end of the day, we have to maximize the value that we're getting out of our workloads. And so when we're when we see companies that are laying five, 10, 20 percent of their workforce off, you're not losing five, 10, 20 percent of your work. You're inheriting five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of your work that you didn't have before. And so if you can if you hit that optimization you find yourself able to innovate and get fat, get faster to market with your development workflows and your product offerings. I'm gonna wait just a beat or two more to make sure there are no more questions and then I'll wrap it up.
What about big data? So that's a great point. There is a, there, because um, products like Apache Spark run on containerized infrastructure, it really is a, it, it really is possible to optimize your your Spark workloads, your EMR workloads in a way that you haven't thought of, it, people haven't thought of before, right? People usually think about big data as a set it and forget it type of situation. And that's no longer true because now you can run those EMR and Spark workloads in Kubernetes containers. And so it becomes a possibility to optimize not only your compute infrastructure and the applications that you're serving, you're able to optimize the behind the scenes processes as well, using the right infrastructure, using bin packing, making sure that your workloads are firing at the right time. That's another big part of it that causes a big amount of spend that people forget about is your data lake. If you can optimize your data lake, you can optimize not only the speed that you, it takes to transform that data and get it ingested into the data warehouse, but you can also make sure that you're running the workloads on the correct infrastructure at the correct time without having to rely on Pago infrastructure? It's a great question. Well, I don't hear any more questions coming in, so I'm gonna just kind of wrap it up here. I, I, I just wanted to keep this short. I didn't wanna bore you guys with a long, hour long presentation. I just wanted to kind of wet your palate. Spot by NetApp does do constant optimization, thin ops type stuff, right? And so if this is something that you wanna hear more about, um, you can contact me. Um, my, I can, send out, I can send out a copy of the slides with my email address on it and I can get you in contact with somebody who is able to um, put you in touch with a demo give answers and questions that you may have, go in depth into your specific use cases, um, give you a personalized overview of how our tools and other tools, right? How COPS can help. If you're not using COPS, if you're not using Carpenter, how those tools can help optimize your workloads. And I'll make sure, Steve, that you get a copy of those slides so that you have them. But thank you so much, everybody, for your time inviting me to present. It's been a pleasure. I hope that if when you guys get in in uh, back to the in person meetings, maybe I can make my way up to um, Canada and come see you guys, and we can do some pizza and DevOps and talk shop. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Sean. That was great. Really appreciate the time. Thanks to everybody who joined, and uh, we hope to see you soon.